Ve çok da şey yapmadan uzamasını engellemeye çalışalım diye düşünüyorum. I know that the number will rise, but I, I don't want any of you to be late, so let, let's start. Today we have two guests of the members of the UN studio, Konstantinos Krisos and Tina Kortman. Um, they have uh, accepted uh, kindly our invitation for a webinar and um, we would like to hear them, we would like to hear from them the project uh, for Frankfurt, a city for all. Um, so um, maybe it's better that you introduce yourselves than I am trying to explain what you uh, what, of, what kind of a background you have. Um, please, uh, the, the, the, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for the invitation on behalf of both of us. Thank you for the patience to make it happen until now. But I think uh, maybe it's better that uh, ladies first and uh, Tina, yeah. uh, you should kind of open the introduction. Um, yeah, hi, uh, good evening. I think you have, it's evening now, right? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so, um, um, yeah, my name is Tina from, uh, and, and I'm uh, actually working for UN Studio since more than 10 years, um, almost 12 now. And um, uh, over the past, I think, uh, five, if not six years, together with Konstantinos, I've been um, uh, uh, working on that uh, um, actually quite special project for Frankfurt. Uh, it has uh, taken quite a big part of our lives uh, in the past years. Um, but um, uh, yeah, it's always a pleasure to also talk about it and to share some experience. Um, so also please feel free to, uh, to ask questions in the end. Um, we are having it a little bit broader uh, tonight so it's um, not only only for Frankfurt but to give it a little bit a broader perspective so um, maybe Konstantinos I pass the word over to you and then also uh, directly after uh, you can start maybe exactly uh, yeah so I'm uh, Konstantinos I've been also I think the same amount of uh, years uh, with Tina I think we have a month or so in difference and indeed, since I think 2016, we started, uh, I mean, you had a little bit earlier with pre-studies, but we did the competition, uh, which kind of allowed us to start this uh, project. Um, I mean, I have also architectural background, finished uh, in Greece, then I was in the States, and then uh, I came back to UN Studio, having had a chance to do projects all around the world. And um, now it's the first time like, I'm doing a project actually in Europe um, so first, we will do a brief introduction about the office. Don't know how much you know, but just to give you a little bit of a spin, a little bit of a feeling of what we do and how we think. And again, as Tina also introduced, we will bring, we will use kind of the thinking of Frankfurt, but also as an offspring to explain our thinking in a broader sense, not just what we do in the project. I hope you can hear us all well. I will share my screen. While you are sharing your screen, I would like to thank Ersin, uh, Ersin Abay, a graduate of our school, uh, who introduced uh, us, introduced me to you and uh, made it possible to invite you uh, and have you here as our guests. Thank you, Ersin. Teşekkür ederiz. Seni de çok özledik. Uzun zaman oldu. İnşallah yakında da görüşmek mümkün olur. So. <laughs> So you should be seeing my screen now? Yes, we are now. Um, I mean, what the first thing to explain, UNS or UN Studio stands for United Network Studio. It's part of our core thinking and how we're organized. Uh, UN Studio together with UN Sense, the daughter company, the whole effort and uh, like thinking behind it is to design about people, to design about nature and think together with nature in order to create sustainable environments that are not based only on uh, architectural gestures, but they're based on a, a long knowledge and research that our uh, studio does, which is reaching out to kind of the human 
interaction with architecture, but also the more data-driven and uh, urban knowledge that is gathered. These allow us to kind of in, um, work on different scales. We have the scale all the way to the product, something that we haven't touched here. We stayed a little bit more on the urban scale, but you see from uh, small interventions in the traditional fabric of um, Amsterdam all the way to our project in Frankfurt for which actually there's also a special door handle design. So you see kind of our cross scale thinking and also in different kind of program qualities from um, the cultural um, icons. This is the Mercedes Benz Museum. And then also the infrastructure project here is a cable car in Russia that crosses the border with China, for example. Then the consciousness about the sustainability and the interest for the environment and how we can kind of push the envelope of architecture in that direction. And here's the example of our building in Delft, in the University of Delft that is under construction right now, which is one of the first um, energy positive uh, educational buildings. This is kind of a, uh, let's say a campus hub where cross-disciplinary uh, activities take place. Uh, then this kind of um, continues to a different scale of thinking and how we can think and experiment and um, plan and now build the smartest neighborhood in Europe. And this is the Brainport Smart District, which we will talk about a little bit later. We brought it in as an urban scale that might be of interest. So just a summary of in a few words from our founder, as it says here, we designed with the future in mind, trying to learn from today, what can we do inform decisions in the future that, that's why we create designs that are adaptive as well as re resilient. This is something, two elements that we will see along our presentation, why it's so important to be flexible in all your decisions in order to be able to react in future conditions. For example, what we're facing now. So the result is a healthier buildings that improve the quality of life. And the quality of life is mainly focused for the user and the person and it's not about the sustainable building it's for a sustainable living um, we are organized in um, multiple locations in a form of a network as well first of all founded um, 35 years ago more or less in amsterdam that's the mothership expanding to the booming china earlier uh, some 15 years ago in shanghai hong kong Recently, uh, together with Tina and the project, we kind of initiated the Frankfurt office that is kind of uh, in, a, in a growing, but now it's working based on the project. And uh, recently we expanded in Dubai, Melbourne, where we have another very big project and there are more places in the network that we are reaching out. UN Studio is organized as well as a network within itself. So you see UN Studio is the core architecture thinking um, uh, firm. But UN Sense is a daughter company, which I'll explain a little bit uh, in a second. But then we have this kind of um, more uh, kind of discourse, the UN, UN Studio talks, which we invite specialists and different people around the field to kind of think together with us, share experiences and produce knowledge. UNX is in, in a similar situation, uh, a unit within the office, which explores the experience of architecture, you Studio Futures on the other side takes that kind of experience that we've built and tries to see how we can project it to the future to help us have more informed decisions today. And then uh, closing the cycle on the scales, we have an interior unit which complements our architecture and the urban unit that kind of gives a broader uh, thinking on the context. UN Sense, on the other side is how this knowledge that is accumulated in architecture can be become a service. So it's not about the building world, but it's the service for the building world. How can we improve the building world with technology in mind and through all this experience? So you see here kind of how these two different um, Polarities are organized with you and Studio in the middle where the architecture and all the more built world is the hardware and then a lot of thinking and the knowledge production is the soft software um, within the company uh, and UN Sense being an offspring that kind of um, 
bring something different uh, to the discourse. This brings us to our topic and I think uh, Tina will introduce a little bit uh, today and um, she will um, kick off the, this uh, presentation today. I've asked a remote control because I think maybe that's easier. I think yes. uh, that should work now. Um, thanks. So um, uh, I think what's uh, important to say before we start all this is that um, uh, for Frankfurt is actually also uh, uh, um, very much about a collaboration um, with HPP. So uh, also going back to the colleagues in Frankfurt that are now with us. Huh? So so we are. Uh, we are actually a joint venture in this project, um, even though you and Studio we've kickstarted it in 2015 uh, with uh, with um, uh, first the urban competition, then an architecture competition that we won. But uh, actually, from the start of the real project onwards, we uh, formed that uh, uh, that team, and um, and I think that's uh, uh, very important also to know. It's a crazy big project that um, uh, partially 70 people are actually working on. So uh, <laughs> I think that that is important. Huh? Like today we will more focus actually on the, on the whole uh, uh, urban uh, quality of it and on the, um, uh, um, yeah, on the, on the more on the architectural meaning of it, but the whole process that is behind, I think um, uh, it deserves another lecture. <laughs> So uh, for for next time. Um, however, no. Why can't I click forward? If you click, uh. yeah. Now it goes. So when we started, um, and that's uh, in a in a way a little bit how we how we want to frame it also. Um, until February last year, we were all actually talking about urban densification, and. Um, that was actually the the word of the moment. We uh, we looked at maps that were foreseeing uh, twenty uh, uh, for 2050, 70 percent of the of the world inhabitants living actually in urban environments. We all know that uh, this uh, may have changed. We don't know. Huh? So I think with um, uh, looking at this in two thousand twenty one. Um, we don't know what the future will actually bring and if it's still about densification it's, or if it is about other things. However, um, even though our perspective has changed um, from actually talking from urban densification, uh, moving over to talking about social distancing, um, we still know that we need to keep our community social, livable and accessible, and especially now in these disruptive times. So how can we actually counteract um, the growing anonymity and loneliness that is also created through these uh, uh, um, uh, aspects? And how can we prevent our societies falling apart? We don't know how long lasting actually this uh, impact uh, will be. Of course, um, not as uh, not on our on us as individuals uh, in our private lives, and not as uh, um, not on uh, on our cities and how we look at them. However, we believe that in the uni we, well, we believe in the unifying uh, power of architecture, and um, that hasn't changed. We also believe that built space can positively influence our coexistence and that inclusive and communicative spaces can create a feeling of togetherness and architecture can play a big role in this. And we believe that more than ever, we need places to connect and places that create identity. We believe that the urgency of creating a city for all is more evident than ever and that designing for social and healthy cities is a key for our future coexistence. And although our lives have changed significantly since then, we believe that for Frank, what For Frankfurt is about could not be any more relevant as of today. For Frankfurt, I already said it briefly before, is a project that we won in 2017 after a two-stage competition that has been in execution since 2018. 
Um, so now it's really, uh, it's, uh, uh, um, I think from uh, uh, mid of this year, the towers will be start to grow into the air. So until now we have only digging in the ground and then it will really start to rise. Completion is planned uh, still for 2023. It's a superlative project in terms of size, complexity and also speed. Um, it has four towers, a multifunctional six-story podium, a four-story underground park, 300,000 square meters of built space and a variety of urban spaces in the heart of Frankfurt. So um, maybe I can point it out once more. What you see here are the four towers. It starts with a small one on the bottom here and it goes all the way up. The motive, however, remains simple. It is a city for all, a city for Frankfurt. And I think uh, what I always like to tell here is that the for Frankfurt um, uh, also really was developed out of the urban and architecture concept that we had uh, delivered in the competition where we said it's the city for all. And so that's also why they introduced that to gaming in the for Frankfurt, which is four towers for Frankfurt. Just a little side note. No. Next page. What's happening? Here we go. Nine. One more took. Yeah. At the interface between block edge development and high rise buildings, the design mediates between the different parts of the city and becomes the connecting anchor point in the skyline. The sculptural appearance of the tower family results from the existing grids and room edges that we find here. So here you see these tangents on this triangular plot. And with that offset, we actually basically created all of the um, volumes. The four vo volumes are twisted and cut to each other in a way um, that despite the high density, which is really a uh, it's a very small pl plot for such uh, amount of square meters that despite the high density, a lot of light and air can actually remain on site. So what you see here is that through um, um, the way that the volumes are cut, um, you never have facing facades. So you always have um, the possibility to look through and allow for light and air to come in, to come in and go out. The towers each have sloping surfaces at the top and at the bottom. We call them kinks. And these are designed in such a way that they optimize the daylight situation in the neighborhood, maintain, um, well, Abstandsflächen. Uh, this is a very German thing. <laughs> so meaning that uh, you know, the shadow cast is actually according to the, uh, to the, to the law, to the urban law. Um, that they break wind, so we don't have these uh, strong fall winds. So you create a better microclimate on the site um, and in the areas close to the ground. With for Frankfurt, the former Deutsche Bank area, um, it really before used to be a vault, <laughs> literally. So uh, there was a vault that we also had to break down under this uh, tower. The whole plot was very much closed. So with um, that new design now, we are actually opening it up again to the city and its residents after more than 40 years. Um, and an introverted site uh, through this becomes an extroverted urban space, a living space for everyone. And I think it's also good to know that the, um, uh, um, the, the way that the mixed use is really uh, um, applied here. So it's not only uh, offices, but it's really, it's residential, it's shops, it's food, it's a supermarket, it's a fitness studio, it's a hotels, it's really a, a crazy amount of uh, functional mix um, that really counteracts the current situation in the urban, direct urban environment, which is very much about the um, about the bank district. So it's at night, it's really quiet and nobody walks there on the street. 
so the, through, through the project, this whole um, uh, atmosphere in this environment will really change and it will really activate the urban heart um, of that area. Permeality, no, up too fast. I'm sorry for the back and forth, but it's not doing what I want. Yeah. Uh, per A. No. Now stay. <laughs> Permeability and a network of squares should integrate the quarter into the urban fabric, as I said before, and make it natural it a natural part of the city. A part of the city that contributes to Frankfurt's identity and becomes a meeting point which one would like to return. The public space continues on a public or semi or partially, sorry, I have to say, on a partially in big parts uh, public roof garden, which you see actually here. And the permeality, I think you can also um, understand here from these side edges that it's really uh, is, uh, uh, yeah, that it can, uh, the, it can flow through from all sides. The publicly accessible roof, which I just mentioned before, is designed as an uh, urban biotope, a green roof landscape that binds the quarter together and gives an identity to the whole area. So it's really an uh, well, it's it's really an attractor, um, uh, will become an attractor for that whole area and and give um, a place to be where people come together. And urban biophilia um, and the positive effect that green has on people's well-being are really in the focus here. It should become an urban space that connects, makes people healthy and happy. <laughs> the theme of the outside space is also continued in the towers. So both of the residential towers and the two office towers have lodgers that uh, break the high rise facades and give the volumes a porous facade and a porous surface. The outside spaces in the tower facades should not only serve to improve the working atmosphere here, but they should also make the human scale visible in the urban scale and in the skyline. The lodges in the residential towers are much smaller and combined in clusters, neighborhoods in the sky, as we uh, call them, which resolve the contradiction between neighborhood and skyscraper, we hope. A neighborhood in the vertical high-rise landscape, a high-rise cluster that stands for Frankfurt. Now, Kostis, I hand it over to you. Yes, thank you. So we saw how this kind of urban identity, which is embedded into the architecture, um, has kind of expressed itself. And now picking up a little bit also on the last points that were mentioned, like human scale and um, identity uh, through the different logias, we will explore how the architecture has a tactility, a three-dimensionality that this can allow for a, a new experience of the city. So in a way, Every time you visit the site, you visit, you understand it in a different way. It's not a static icon, but it's something that kind of um, uh, evolves every time you come back. So again, here, this human scale was very important to be reflected into the building. But this kind of relation of an icon or an after image, as we call it in the office, that is, um, brought onto the buildings are usually also, as we mentioned before, based on knowledge and based on information and adapting to certain conditions. As the site kind of informed the volumes, now in the similar way, we developed the idea of this kind of 360 skyline, which is, has these kind of um, formal gestures and then also the quality of the facade that will Every time that you see it from a different um, perspective, you would see something different and you can kind of 
orient yourself, but also reinvent the site every time. So the process behind that, in order to bring that scale and these qualities, is an informed process. As we see here, first, um, kind of an adaptive uh, reaction to environmental uh, parameters. In a similar way, contextual parameters within the side distances, how the volumes, as we said earlier, reacted, now also the facades react within each other. And then there are different characters created uh, because of this kind of interrelation between neighborhood, between uh, orientation, um, and slowly, slowly between program. This kind of then allows for this kind of more intelligent population of the facades with elements that can incorporate that kind of knowledge. And we start seeing where the human scale starts to appear and creates um, a richness that it's not random or arbitrary, which is informed, but at the same time, it's personal. It kind of relates, uh, you can relate with which is your loggia, which is your pixel, pixel in the facade, that is your office cell. So this is kind of the big important, um, import, uh, the important thing that we uh, try to achieve through this kind of play of volumes that also kind of expand on the facades, enriching the skyline of Frankfurt. It creates something that is meaningful and something that can reflect back to your memory. With another example of this, uh, I will also kind of introduce the kind of first big project of our office, which kind of started um, the studio is the bridge in, in, there in, in, in Rotterdam, the so-called Erasmus Bridge. Started from a simple sketch, kind of trying to solve some statical problems, which then kind of developed into a very primary and very, prim very early software to digitize the different knowledge, but these were all very engineering questions. And this was like a very big engineering challenge. So again, there we learned how to use knowledge and kind of work on it to be able to redefine a whole city. This didn't become now just an infrastructural element that connects two sides of the city, but it started becoming a play of words from between citizens. Others would see it like a bow, others would see it like a swan. But it, at the end of the day, it was a very engineered process that it kind of was informed and in bringing more and more depth and um, quality to the architecture. And this is kind of the, the big importance there that it, the, the, the end result is that these kind of meaningful, meaningful places are created that reflect back to the person. Like everybody reads it in a different way and it can go to the point that has a lasting impact. Here we see a sailor because that bridge reminds me, reminds me of his home. It was important for him to have it with him every time that he sails around the world. So this kind of informed process is not per se for the architecture, but it's actually to bring closer to the user and the person and the citizen and the tenant, the quality uh, that architecture brings to the city in the end of the day. It's not the building anymore, but it has an impact in a bigger scale. So this is very important for our architecture, seeing that kind of relation. And now we will see a little bit how this kind of moves to the future. Uh, you're unmuted. Yeah, and I was just saying, and I will try the remote control again. <laughs> So resilience, um, like I like also maybe maybe good to say that we we we try to to to to define three really focal points of uh, of today's talk. So um, uh, after uh, after inclusiveness, tactility, we uh, chose now as a third one for resilience, um, as this is I think everybody is currently talking about resilience, um, but it is actually one of the most important properties when it comes to future-proofing the built environment. And there are different ways of achieving it, obviously. And again, it doesn't do what I want. Yeah. <laughs> so how can we think and plan our cities uh, and buildings in such a way that we can actually create uh, flexible um, spaces that our cities and 
buildings can react to future requirements. We need cities, you know, we need cities and buildings that can react and that are adaptable. We need flexible spaces. Flexible is sustainable as well, uh, because what can be changed, what can adapt will remain and will also flourish, we believe. But how can we allow our buildings actually to grow and shrink? Um, also our cities to take on new functions in short to react. And uh, for Frankfurt, we have one approach, um, which is actually uh, that we are creating here an adaptive building through a modular approach. So modular thinking does not only allow us to manage this uh, uh, crazy complexity of this project, but it also provides user flexibility, long life performance and a sustainable construction. And it also is a long term property circle and sustainable investment. In, um, in that uh, project in four, we, for example, worked with a specialist for modular planning and building, which is called Digitalis Bauen, um, in uh, BIM to develop a system that is actually taken into account all trades, breaks down the complex geometries into simple components so that it becomes manageable. And most important that as a result, we have four buildings that can be configured by their users, not only today, but also tomorrow. Possible wall positions and room modules um, are predefined in a manual that ensures the flexible future of the building. So that is also how it actually is built together in the end and how the single components um, can, um, can also be uh, um, yeah, moved and, and, and taken apart once the lifespan is over. So that's how the whole sustainable aspect also comes into place. Um, with the next project, we, uh, Kostis uh, mentioned it's uh, already in the beginning, so we are leaving a bit now the foresight, maybe hopefully not too soon. <laughs> um, we, uh, we continue about actually talking about resilience, about modularity and circularity, but also about a lot more, we believe. Um, in a way, um, a lot of things that you in studio is about, it's called Brainport, Brainport Smart District. Um, it is an urban development project, an urban vision. You could say a, a utopia, a living lab for a better, smarter and more beautiful and sustainable world um, that is about to be built on an area of 150 hectares between Eindhoven and Helmond in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there she is. Nein. <sighs> Elfie Nellison, uh, she's the Dean of the TU Eindhoven, one of the initiators of the project. And she asked what will be necessary to realize a better, smarter, more beautiful and sustainable living environment. A wonderful question, of course, without any simple answers. That's why experiments should be carried out in a wide variety of subject areas, mobility, digitalization, health, energy, and participation are topics that are here at stake. And again, it's frozen. You want to go back? No, nah, now it's, uh, no, it's okay. <laughs> the master plan is designed as a framework um, where the participants, um, which are consortia from different parties, such as architects, entrepreneurs, and other good doers, do-gooders, <laughs> can apply to implement their idea for a better world on the site. A master plan for a laboratory of the future, it actually is. Innovation should take place here at all levels, in living and working, in the shared and green spaces, um, and in the relationship between landscape and buildings is very central here. A shared park in the middle around which living and working are organized around. Surrounded 
by a productive landscape. Thanks to its modular structure, here again, the plan offers flexibility and growth opportunities. Brainport Smart District aims to focus on climate change and circularity on an integrated sustainability in this case. Ecological, social and economic sustainability are the goal here. Potential synergies between the various research projects and subjects are um, to be identified. So um, in the team with landscape architects and sustainability experts, we have developed here concepts for integral sustainability to the area. And um, it is designed self-sufficient self and as a basis for the zoning plan in the beginning, it was calculated actually how much uh, space would be needed for solar energy or wind turbines and rain retention basins so that actually those would really find a place from the beginning. And in addition, local food production um, should be strengthened here with the plan. So um, the master plan is actually surrounded uh, with um, um, uh, regional uh, uh, food production so that the relationship with the, with the regional food production can be better promoted. And we have calculated that actually 30% of the necessary food can be produced locally. The cornerstones for these developments are social, physical and mental health for the residents and circular earning models such as the sharing company and the circular building principle. Um, and it goes even further. The digital networking should help here to make um, the implementation of these cornerstones possible. So a data platform is really um, uh, established here as an extra layer to exchange or to establish the exchange between the residents and the um, and the city. So. Um, like an additional infrastructure layer. It goes again too fast. There we are. So um, an app, uh, uh, for instance, is also developed. So you can actually see where the free, spa uh, where the, where the free parking space is, how much cucumbers still need to be, uh, <laughs> still need to be grown or who rents out their car in the weekend. So that really this becomes an integral part of the urban planning. And that a shared community uh, here is um, uh, well tested really as a shared economy. Um, and I think, um, yeah, this can be really role model for participation in 2021. So um, that also really the maybe not always so social network is really helping to uh, create a positive impact on the society. And that uh, that way technology is uh, really uh, helping to create a better place in that, uh, in that sense on this area. So it becomes part of um, um, creating that really interchange between the residents and the city. And that, uh, well, in a way after all after, after this, that on our, from our point of view, it's the experimental and the open-minded approach to a project that uh, um, I think is show, shown in this one, but it's also in For Frankfurt, that allows us to make uh, work surprising and diverse and uh, uh, have hopefully a lasting impact on how we live together um, and how we can also uh, future-proof the future and uh, create chances and opportunities for all of us to live together. So uh, let's learn by doing <laughs> uh, as a motto. I think um, with this, I would like to end. So maybe Kostis, if you want to have some last words. No, I think- Or if um, we want to open the floor for questions. I think it's a, it's a good conclusion to finish by learning by doing. So um, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Um, while starting with the questions uh, and, and uh, opening the platform for questions and answers, I would like to ask first that um, this uh, BSD, the uh, brain, what? Mm -hmm. 
um, that that project is after the you have won the the competition of for yeah. Frankfurt, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think actually, it... so they uh, they both were um, they both were developing um, similar in similar times, uh, as far as I can understand. So one mm -hmm. on a flat uh, land and one going to a high rise. Yeah. So, um, um, you said that there are similarities. Can you open that up, please, a little bit more? So uh, yeah. about the similarities that are in, in terms of the, the housing, maybe the units, etc. Yeah. Now, fr first of all, the, um, the BrainPod Smart District, I think, was designed in 2009 if not 18, 19, I think. 18, 19. So, 19. yeah. So, okay. uh, and it's, and it's uh, currently ongoing. Eh? So it's really uh, like a, like this, um, um, uh, like all the, like every um, area, what you see, every module is a, uh, um, was, um, there was, was, how do you say, um, given to uh, consortia to really develop ideas on that plot. Mm -hmm. And that is still ongoing, so it's not built yet. But the whole process of mm -hmm. building um, is uh, is actually now happening. So I think you know maybe we can share afterwards also the um, the link to the to the website. I think it's very nice where every where all these participants can actually um, uh, are, are see can be seen and and you can understand their different ideas. So you had to apply for for this area to. Um, yeah, and, and to, to apply by saying how you would actually make a difference here um, to, uh, to allow for building. So um, uh, it's, it is a very, uh, it is also in that sense curated to get hopefully, yeah, the most out of it um, and to really have a um, test field here. And of course, the similarities to, to four are not, it's not, that evident, huh? of course. It's. Uh, I think you cannot say that typology is. Uh, um, is the typology is related here? It's more that the um, the the idea of creating identity for the inhabitants, and the idea of um, or or also let's say the search for ways of creating identity and for for people to participate in the urban environment. I think that um, search is in a way the base point for both. And maybe to add also the, the from the first part, the sociality of the two. I mean, one is expanding in a horizontal way, one expanding in an upper way, but this is kind of how do you create communities in different uh, orientations, upward, sideways. And most of all that it's kind of for both, like from four, it's more traditional, let's say building project, whereas this one, you can implement a lot of your knowledge to kind of further architecture and not just uh, implement like um, a real estate project in the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, um, for any questions, we are open now. So uh, e either you can write it down on the chat box or you can uh, open up your microphone and ask. So feel free to, to uh, say a few words, dear friends, dear colleagues. Okay. Uh, this is so, uh, the, the, the fear yeah. that I have always at the end of uh, the seminars uh, or, or conferences when you ask if, if you uh, have any questions, etc. So, and there is a huge silence where <laughs> almost no, can... every time the, the uh, same joke comes back. So everything was clear, etc. So uh, are there any, any uh, questions? Yeah, okay. I want to mention, first of all, can you hear me, right? Yes, yes, we yes. can. Yeah, first of all, thank you for the presentation, the colleagues from UN Studio. It's, it was, I hope it's very good for the others also, for the participants. There is one point that uh, I really like about this project too. Uh, there is a historical building, a Deutsche Bahn, in front of this building. And there is a really good uh, passage from the history to, to the technology. That part, as I want to... I want to yeah emphasize that it's 
Uh, maybe I would like, maybe, yeah, maybe I would like to hear uh, 26. If you go to 26. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this, this, this way it's, um, I mean, this is really hard. Also, I know in, in Turkey, we have also this kind of problems always. We have very historical places, historical buildings and creating a new, uh, new building surroundings. It's always really problematic. So I would like to hear what would you, what you will think, what, how you were approaching this project at the beginning because you have a historical facade and you're creating something behind of it also. Yeah, I think if I would uh, just take the lead on this, there are different qualities on uh, every building, right? So um, then there is the, the urban context and the quality that they give in that. And then there's the building uh, itself. So um, in our site, as you see, uh, I mean, I don't know if you knew the site, how it looked before. There was also a very interesting almost... Uh, modernist uh, tower, which had also a certain quality. And there, architecture then that needs to evolve if something hasn't been programmed in a flexible way, then needs to kind of allow space for the next generation in a way. But some buildings like the one that we see uh, slightly here, which is kind of kept intact, but also the, the, the facade along the, this uh, side street um, has a memory. So that's where the important part is that you want to keep a memory to the city, but still uh, allow it to develop. So there, but that doesn't make it all, always an economically efficient, um, let's say, endeavor. And that's usually the reason that things don't happen in such an easy way uh, in order to kind of allow the reuse and redevelopment of these buildings. So. Um, and maybe maybe what could be added here is that we um, um, uh, even though we've also gone through a process of different variations i have to say of course but that we have decided for um, cutting on this image you unfortunately you don't really see it um, but but there like there are moments where we really cut into that existing building and um, here in the front, you see one element. There's a long horizontal one exactly there somewhere in this area. And there's a um, there's one here at the very end, which forms the main entrance to Tower 4, which is the small one here that you see. And um, we have been looking really for a language that also matches the way we deal with entrance situations on the, um, on the inner courtyard. So through that, almost to scale up, the gesture and material and language um, and um, bring it to the other side. So to really uh, uh, yeah, create here not uh, a clear cut also to uh, um, between uh, old and new, um, uh, actually literally <laughs> a cut. And, um, um, uh, and, and at the same time, I believe we, we've, we managed to uh, find a very decent way of um, doing this uh, without really uh, screaming over the old existing building, but to allow in a way for both to yeah to coexist. The the the building was you said the the function of it was Ar Arsen. We have we well, well huh? which ones yeah. all all of the them old, no no no the old the, the old building that that is here. Mm -hmm. uh, what what was it again? I'm so sorry. A the bank. Site, a bank. A bank. The Deutsche the, Bank. Yeah, the Deutsche German Bank. Central Bank yeah. was and it was there. it was really a, a vault. So, mm -hmm. um, like also literally a vault, not only a vault in the sense of being locked to the rest of the city and for the urban space, but it, but it was empty. but totally it, empty. Huh? No, it no, no. Like no, like no, like a, a bank building, and there was like with vault. I mean, uh, two two things. First, like the whole plot was locked. Right, yeah. so you couldn't enter. So it was oh, just yeah. Like I, I read that closed. for forty-five yeah. years, it was unaccessible. Un exactly says. because yeah. it was for security reasons. So yeah. it was just like an inner courtyard to uh, the Deutsche Bank, mm -hmm. and then um, underneath the tower, um, that um, one of the one of the buildings that 
which um, underneath the tower, um, bank tower that was demolished, there was actually a big vault even okay. on the in the in the basement. So that's where mm -hmm. where where I meant the link. Yeah. So it was literally also a vault, but also uh, um, in the meaning um, of the word to the rest of the city. Yeah. So, um, okay, um, any other, um, there was a question, Burju, would you like to ask yourself, dear Burju Sevin Chilmas, uh, one, again, one of our, um, one, a, a colleague, a very dear colleague and uh, a, a graduate of our school, Burju, if you would like to speak, but seems she's not. Do you think will coronavirus change the design approaches of urbanization? Now, I mean, every, every um, I mean, everyone is wondering that right now, I think, and uh, it, it would be very interesting to hear your opinion about that. Uh, I mean, personally, I think to say change, for sure will have an impact. But we won't start designing completely different buildings before, because still the program and the way that we um, kind of react to built environment won't change in that degree. But part of what we discussed, like this kind of flexibility um, that a building has is important. For example, like there are new factors that are valued more right now in terms of the um, of the current COVID situation. And for example, these are public spaces, green spaces, but this was a quality that is necessary to architecture and it's, and it's kind of re enriched and reinforced. But that's something, for example, like we see also here, there's a huge roof, uh, which is open for public. Like it kind of, within this dense environment, you try to create a more sociable and living space. And that also kind of relates to more this restricted situation that we have that we wouldn't make let's say a high rise very different because anyway here we're trying to introduce this kind of openness not not not not a clustered density but a density an urban density but with variety of programs and and uh, many different uh, open spaces that come together uh, but i do i do think um that the idea of uh, well, that the importance of urban space uh, has also, uh, in a way, uh, made its way to uh, developers and like and and to uh, other people than architects and urban planners. It really sunk into their mind that you need uh, open spaces, that you need green spaces. So I think maybe in a way our work will get easier. <laughs> Uh, in the future that's what i would hope because i think the ideas don't really change i think the the idea for uh, um for social space for open space for green space i think that all has been there but it's always been so difficult to sell it to your clients and and i think now we really have a moment where we have the right arguments at hand so um and and i think in a way here in four we have the uh, lucky coincidence that we have a fun I, I think even even though it's a very difficult client, it's also a fantastic client because they really um, uh, uh, also are following a vision here, right? So without without the client and the city and us as planners working together, we wouldn't be able to achieve this. Um, and I think that um, um, uh, uh, despite all uh, um, area efficiency, I, I don't know if everybody of you uh, has ever uh, has that experience, what it means <laughs> to work for developers. Uh, so it's it's really, uh, uh, they are really beating the square meters out of you, right? So, so it's, uh, I think it's, um, uh, it's like to, to still create a project and to, well, to, to really bring it to the finish line with all these initial ideas that we have actually thought of. I think this is very unique. And, um, and of course you lose some things on the way. Uh, I think uh, also, you know, we should be honest about it, but I think the main things are really still there. And, and in a way, a proof of concept, I believe is that um, um, uh, different than all the other buildings around our, um, our houses here, like the, the, the areas are sold and rented out as uh, warm cookies still. 
so it's uh, it's not so it's really uh, um, I think that's also in a way of course it's a financial success also for the client but it's also yeah a proof of concept that um, um, that um, um, we have uh, in a way maybe we have planned here future proof we will of course know in the future but the future, it, yeah. but it but, but but it seems so that at least now this uh, uh, earthquake that we are all uh, uh, going through at the moment it uh, actually uh, it can't harm it so uh, yeah yeah so um, actually uh, it's always uh, very interesting to have the opinion of of the inhabitants that are going to experience all that here and both here and BSD actually because um again i mean um, you have you are planning uh, for the future for the people that are going to be living here etc but then actually you you see it in their faces when you meet them after all right yeah. so uh if if it was uh, as planned uh, let's say um that that would be a very interesting approach to to meet again in in five or ten years maybe and then ask you again if if everything but well, how everything did turn up so yeah yeah okay um any other questions do we have any other questions it's turkish but <laughs> i don't know but it's know? also an old one Ah, no, no, this, this ah, okay, was from was... Burcu, Burcu uh, said she would like to ask in person, but she's okay. in a crowded ah, and okay. loud place. Ah, so. Okay, oh, good. Um, you'll meet another time then. Uh, any other questions? Türkçe sorabilirsiniz. Ben çevirebilirim. Var mı acaba soru? Okay, so, and thank you very much, actually. This was, was a very, very interesting um presentation an interesting project i would love to see actually the uh, interiors as well the plan the plans the the housing plans and how how they are combined etc but that will be my work to make a research about that so um we have in gildas uh, different uh, levels of of uh, architectural students right here and and some one group is actually working on housing projects so that would that is also interesting for them as far as i can understand so, i will uh, hmm. wait i will share the link also of the uh, website the, of the website the project oh. website uh in the chat where's the chat here it is but the topic oh. of housing oh no sorry <laughs> that was, that was wrong. <laughs> sorry yeah, that no. uh that's interesting. Um, from well, I think the paste. topic of housing is it's also a very like interesting other discussion because here we didn't really touch upon it. We touch about the environment within yeah, uh, yeah, the housing course. that I is mean, happening. Because in terms of uh, in terms of urban uh, approaches, I, I know, but that was um, a, a, um, a curiosity of mine. So no yeah, problem with yeah. that. So. No, but uh, it's, uh, it's, an, it's an interesting problematic because that's also a very contemporary problematic also for our office. Netherlands is like in a huge housing demand and um, uh, within, you know, confined space, we know that, you know, uh, Netherlands is like mostly reclaimed land. And this is kind of a, a further study that is happening. And maybe one project that uh, people can refer to as well that is recently uh, launched, it's called Van B. It's in Munich and it's kind of new, small, modular housing. Mm -hmm. Again, researching, seeing how can we live in, an, in, in a good quality, but in a condensed quality, like how we would see in Japan and in Tokyo, these kind of uh, cubicles, rethinking it in a more humane scale, but mm -hmm. still it's a developer with a vision willing to experiment. And that could also be an interesting, but it's a side topic just because uh, you mentioned it. Uh, you know. mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. So, um, well, I will thank you in the name of all uh, our students, of uh, my colleagues that are here and uh, of the faculty and of uh, our research center. It was a very nice, a, a great pleasure to meet you. And it was a great pleasure to listen to you tonight. 
So thank you very much for, for um, accepting. And uh, I hope we can uh, have you here in person, as I said before. So then we, we, would, we would be very happy to have you physically in our school and um, which has actually a very historical atmosphere that would uh, really had an impact on you, I'm sure. I, I hope we can do that again. So thank you very much for um, all of our guests here, our, our Konstantinos Krisos, Tina Kortman, Ersin, <gülüyor> again, thank you for making it possible. Teşekkür ediyorum katılımlarınız için. Sevgili arkadaşlarım, sevgili hocalarım, iyi akşamlar diyorum. Have a good evening then. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye bye. bye. bye.